Yeah, although she had many challenges, she never let it affect her outlook on life and she always appreciated everything she had and wanted to help others who either needed help or were, you know, less, their circumstances were even worse off. She always saw the best in things and she was like that with everyone else and it was infectious. If you were around her, you never thought of any of the negatives or any of the challenges. You just thought, you know, here, here's someone who's making the most out of out of her life and, and she really did and, and until the very end and it was just so tragic to lose someone like that when she had so much life and love left to give and it was just under such horrible circumstances that she would want her memory to go to making sure other people don't have to suffer the same way. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, I'm not here, like, you know, at first, if you haven't heard from me in the next three, four hours, call the police. And she would make it as a, as a joke, right? You know, it's not like she was serious or anything. She would just say, like, you know, I'm here. If you haven't heard from me in the next three, four hours, you know what to do. <laughs> oh, God. How I knew January was, um, well knew her in physical form, know her in spiritual form. Um, she, when I had the salon here in Gastown, she came by and sort of met through the community at large and, you know, wanted to be a part of what we were doing because I worked with my business partner at the time. We were both women who were going through our gender transition. Um, and we offered a safe space as well for individuals to sort of come into and January came in. Yeah, she made us laugh, she made our clients laugh, she was fun, she was funny. And anything that she would say that was a little bit goofy or stupid, we, and nobody's stupid, um, we just may ask the wrong questions. She was always quick to own it and, and laugh at herself, which we find a lot of people don't do. And if you can't laugh at yourself, then what's the point? So that's in a nutshell, how we got to know January and her personality and be a part of her world and her be a part of ours. Well, first anything, as I said, four years ago when we were here, um, there was a lot of police cars and um, we were not even able to go near a few meters close here because there was a police cross lines. And um, if I'm not mistaken, um, there was a lot of like dried blood on that pavement. And that was very hard to say extremely hard to see and you'd see the police and uh, the investigators going back and forth um, to their vehicles and to their cars and, and so I guess it's another reason why we were just so quiet you know the good ten of us or nine of us that we were here during that time were so quiet because we were so shocked and and that, that's where the fear is coming from seeing all those investigators and the police officers um, you know, doing their things. Mm -hmm. um, but she hadn't come back to us and said this was going on. And when I picked up the 24-hour magazine, reading it at the gym, sitting on the bicycle, I remember it clear as day, and there it was. And it was, uh, no one wants to find out that way, ever. When I, I was away again, I went back to California. When I come back, I just get the bad news that he, he was killed and murdered. January is a nice person. She got a heart. That's what, that's what everybody telling. 
it's not only me said make everybody happy every time she joined the crowd everybody cannot help laughing the way she act the way she talk the way she joke After he died, I have no choice but to commit him. That's the cheapest one, so I can bring him home. <coughs> and we and we back home. I'm bringing home. She want before she before he die. I uh, he he asked me to if I can I can bring him back home. I said yes. And by the time I'm trying to <coughs> process all uh, his paper because he lost all his identity. He lost the passport. He lost the ID. Everything. I'm trying to get another one for him, but it was too late. Because when I come back home from when I was away and come back home, it, it, it was really unexpected. I really again, I didn't get, I didn't know. His sudden death is really traumatic for me. <laughs> it's good that. There are people who, just like us and Imar, who's always there supporting January every time. And also, as of now, he's still helping January. <laughs> it's really hard, you know. I lost my mother, I lost my sister, but to lose a son or a daughter, it's really hard for a mother. When she found out, um she used to walk her dog all the time here, and when she found out about January, uh, she managed to uh, connect with us, and um, it, it was really hard. It was really hard to. Um, it was really hard for her because um, you know, because every time she walks her dog, January would stop. Every time they cross path, and January will just give nothing but compliments. You know, she would compliment her her dog. Everything you name it, her hair, her dress, her smile, and any, anything you can think of, and um, it would it would just really make her day. Yeah. So um, yes. And I think sometimes that was her way of coping with a lot of suffering on the inside, a lot of hurt on the inside, a lot of pain on the inside. I think she had a lot of issues as a transgender woman going through transition, living in poverty. Um, being involved in, you know, the sex trade. Um, she, was, uh, she was adopted. Um, she faced a lot of rejection in society. A lot of people didn't accept her. They thought she was um, different. I remember when I had watched on the news about January being stabbed to death, I had felt extremely vulnerable. I had spent a lifetime in a sex trade. And I have known many trans women that have died in Vancouver. So it hasn't been a death for many, many years, so it really rocked me. It, it really hit me somewhere hard. 
It made me feel like I was unsafe and I didn't know who to trust. What was that like, just hearing about her death? Well, because I was a sex trade worker, um, it's something that is always on the back of my mind. It's something that's always a risk. It's something that I've thought about over my head a thousand times in my lifetime, and I could imagine the agony she would have been in, the thoughts going through her head, the fear, the panic, the questioning. The reality is that a lot of our lives are difficult. Um, a lot of us have ups and downs, and sometimes those downs can be really low, and sometimes those highs can be really highs. And I think that what a lot of people forget is that we're still human. You know, yes, some of us do choose to partake in survival sex work, but there are a lot of other surrounding reasons about why we make that decision and why we feel it's a necessity to um, help fund the surgeries or the type of things that we need to make us feel comfortable. I think a lot of people have this idea, in my experience, that yes, I may look and pass like a woman, but there are things in my transition that I do need for myself. And it does not mean because I'm close looking to a female that I should have gratitude. It's, in my opinion, saying that because I look so much like a woman, I shouldn't want more and I should be really grateful that I have that. But there are still things that I need for myself to make myself feel comfortable. So for me, in my understanding of the experience, that's why a lot of us um, choose to partake in survival sex work because we have things that um, we need to get done and it's a sense of urgency. It's not later and it's not, it can't be done in a, a, a numerous steps. You know, We're trying to build comfortable in our bodies as we navigate the world. You know, a lot of cisgendered people, and what I mean by cisgendered people is people who um, were born in the gender that they um, ascribe to, already have that comfortableness. So when they're working, you focus on your work. When you're going to school, you focus on your school. You know, as a trans woman in my daily life, I'm always having to be concerned with how I am presenting to people on an everyday basis. How am I feeling right now? Um, as I said, um, definitely brings back a lot of good memories. I remember when she was just stand here or sit in the corner waiting for us. So, and she's always the highlight, right? So every time we have an event, um, you know, people come to our events because of January. So, yeah. So it, it, it. it I, I don't know how to describe my feelings right now. <gasps> yes. You know, January was the life of our group. She was the social glue. She was like the mother of our group, you know. Um, me and my best friend, Ash, you know, two, whenever you get two gay queens trying to run a social organization, there's going to be drama. And January was there to, you know, make sure everything went smoothly. And um, uh, it was, um, you know, she was, she was a great singer. She was a great dancer. People loved her. Uh, she had a lot of friends. Um, she was so funny. She was so hilarious. Like, she would go and approach people on the street and say, um, Hi, my name is January. I know it's a cold month, but I make it hot. I was already in the bus. As I said, I was sitting next to um, uh, a seat next to a window, and then she sat next to me. Like, and then that's how the conversation started. So she was standing in this bus stop, mm -hmm. and I, I instantly recognized that she's from the Philippines. Um, just her fashion style, um, her hairstyle, the way um, she was carrying her bag. <laughs> yeah, so I, I knew that she, came, you know, she's uh, she's from the Philippines. And instantly, when she sat next to me, I introduced myself that my name is Ash and I'm from the Philippines. And that's how the conversation started. Did she get excited? She was very excited because um, there's very few. Um, 
Indians like me who lives in the Philippines. So she was very shocked that I speak Filipino or Tagalog. So yes. She got a very nice leg, like nicer, nicer than my leg. <laughs> Even when she's young, she's small, small boy. He is uh, uh, the the skin is very nice. And you know that she was she's my just adopted son, right? You don't know. She's just my adopted. Not my, not my real son. That's why maybe she, the thing is, that's why she, she cannot move on because of her, of her past, uh, past life that happened. She know uh, what happened to him. The mom sold, sold him to me just for 1,000 peso. What is 1,000 peso, not even $10? Convert to Philippine money. Yeah, not even one hundred dollar. <laughs> Every time we 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 drive together in my car, I just tell her, "Can you sing my favorite song?" She will sing. You know what is what's that song? No matter what, my voice on. No matter what, have you seen? Have you heard the song? No. It's a nice song. Yeah, so yeah, we uh, we had. I think we joined the parade for about four or five times, and then after her passing, we stopped joining. Um, you know, she has a big role during Pride parades, and especially in our float, because you know she used to host our float and made everybody um, excited, right? So a lot of people would come to our and join the float because January was there. And yeah, so we won one time. We, we won um, the, uh, the most diverse award. So that was great. And, you know, a big part of it because of, you know, of January. So that's, yeah. She liked the one who like, kind of like riled up the crowd. <laughs> Absolutely. She would call everyone on, um, you know, everybody in the crowd and, you know, make silly jokes and made them laugh. So, yeah. We started to attract, we had, um, uh, a, a bang bang Bollywood night, a Bollywood night at the largest, one of the largest nightclubs in Vancouver. We, we, were, we took a big risk. We had it during Pride Week. We thought no one would show up because we didn't have that many members in our group to fill the place. We packed the place. Over 500 people showed up. And a big reason was January and Ash were on the streets, putting up posters, selling tickets, talking to their friends on the phone. She did that. She got the people out. And it was the amazing Bollywood night. There was straight people there. There was gay people there. There was drag queens there. There was transgender people there. And um, she made it come alive. And um, she made it happen. She could make these things happen. And she did this kind of stuff, right? And uh, she was so grateful to, um, my mom treated her like a daughter. You know, my mom said, you know, she would, uh, she would come into my house and she would cook food for my mom. And, and she loved cooking, generally loved cooking. She was a fabulous chef. And she could just scrap up a wonderful meal out of just nothing in the fridge. I don't know, I don't know how she did it. And uh, so, um, but you know, uh, yeah. Okay. Mm. So this was um, the plan that January gave me as a, as a, as a gift for my first house and um, she was very happy and excited for, for me that I finally have my own place. So um, it just symbolizes that, you know, um, many things for her. And if I recall, she said, you know, I'm giving you this as a, as a symbol of, um, of, of success.
the first thing I do is I really made sure like I, I would touch the plant and it just gives me that sense of um, happiness that January is in my house, in my home. January was an amazing friend. Uh, she um, had this vibrancy around, about her and uh, she was super funny and knew how to sing. Um, I first met January during um, Pride and I will never forget uh, her emceeing skills. Um, she always got the crowd just going and, um, and everybody would just cheer and there was some, um, there was just something about her that always just drew people toward her and gravitated toward her energy. And she looked amazing during Pride. She always wore the best, sexiest outfits during Pride. Um, and yeah, I'll definitely miss her. As a trans woman of color, as I mentioned before, I don't really see people who look like me in the world. A lot of when I want to see people who look like me, I have to search on Facebook and, you know, go into groups and, you know, watch videos of other trans women of color there. I, you know, for me, it's, I find it to be very frustrating at times and also it can be very empowering. You know, a, a lot of what I say isn't really questioned. So that is a gift in itself. But when it comes to camaraderie and not feeling alone, you know, those are issues that I, that I personally find that can be improved. Um, as I sit here, you know, trans women of color, specifically black trans women, have a 50% higher rate of HIV. And, you know, those issues to me are so important. Why is it that women who look like me, who inhabit space like me, are at a higher risk or at a higher exposure of obtaining HIV? Why is that? What tools are we not utilizing? How can we make it better within the community spaces to allow for um, inclusivity? <laughs>